Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here. It's October 13th, and this is day three, probably the last day on this uh, radio. What I'm going to be doing today to it is I'm going to replace a few capacitors underneath, uh, maybe check a few voltages on it, uh, maybe discover a resistor or two that needs to be changed, and then try to perform an alignment on the radio. I won't try to perform it, I will perform it. It's very simple. The alignment's very simple. But I want to start off by going through the uh, uh, service manual and in particular the uh, circuit diagram and just get myself familiar with the uh, layout uh, of this radio. So let's take a look at the service manual. So all of this has come from Pacific TV. It's on the west coast of Canada. The uh, Pacific TV website has a lot of Canadian schematics, including this one. So I have model 47A. I don't know what the A means. It's not covered in here, I don't think. The A probably denotes a rather minor alteration in it. And another radio, number 48. 48 appears to be a two-band version of 47. That's what it looks like. So as we go through here, we got to make sure we're reading about the right radio. So, uh, specifications for the Model 47. Five tube heterodyne radio receiver with automatic volume control, pentode output, and an electrodynamic speaker. A phono jack provides input for high impedance pickup. 115 volts, 30 watts, normal broadcast band range, intermediate frequency. 460, something to keep in mind. A lot of radios are 455. Audio output, one and a half watts. And here's the tubes, the Philco. Of course, they're trying to sell tubes. You know, radios were tube selling devices, so they're trying to sell Philco tubes here. Um, and so this, this is definitely, these tubes are definitely reminiscent of the 1930s. It's like the 80 rectifier too. Okay. Alignment of compensators. Interesting choice of words. Compensators. Compensating for small variations in the circuit that the uh, manufacturer cannot uh, ensure are precise. That's kind of the bottom line of what all these compensators are for. List of equipment. Got to be Philco equipment. We're not doing the alignment right now, but vacuum tube voltmeter sensitive audio output meter connecting the equipment we'll study that more when alignment time comes here's the alignment chart it's really only two steps to it this last step is just a check it's very very simple to align this radio okay that's for the other radio alignment steps more steps because it has more bands here's some notes I'll just go back up here yeah, note A, note B, and C. Let's just look at those just to see what they are. Note A, a dummy antenna consisting of a 0.1 microfarad condenser connected in series with the high side of the signal. Okay, dummy antenna for RF circuits, 100 picofarad condenser, okay. Note C, dial must be aligned to track properly with the tuning condenser. This is accomplished by closing the tuning condenser maximum capacity and setting the pointer on the small line just before the 550 kilocycle mark on the scale. I don't have this scale, but I figured out that we can just look at where the pointer was sliding before and be fairly sure at least of returning it to where it was. But uh, and that's probably good enough tube and component layout. Notice in this can there's only one adjustment. I actually peeked in the can, it's true, there's only one adjustment here. Location of compensators. Com com compensators? <laughs> List of parts. There we are. That's one radio, this is the other one. You can tell right away that the difference. This has one set of antenna coils here. This one has two. This one has one set of oscillator coils. This one has two. That's a 
pretty much a giveaway that this is a double band radio down here. All the other hints, but we're not worried about it. This is the one we want to look at. Right here. So let's start with the power supply. Uh, filaments driven by one winding. Um, heating rectifier. Here's the filter system to get rid of the hum. And a radio like this that's using the coil here, either a choke, like an independent choke, or in this case, the uh, field coil of the speakers. I'm doing double duty, this is generating the magnetic field, but it's also serving as the uh, filter inductor in the power supply. You notice how small these capacitors are, 10 and 10. The bulk, and in my experience, uh, the bulk of the filtering is occurring here. And when you see a radio with a uh, electromagnetic field coil instead of a permanent magnet, you can almost bet that it won't hum or hum much at all. So these guys, uh, they may be due for change, um, but the radio has only the slightest hum in it. It might be a little more pronounced once the radio goes back in its cabinet. So, so we'll have to consider whether to change these or not. Part of that is trying to maintain the originality of the radio. Well, very few old radios have original filter capacitors in these positions. If they do, almost always these capacitors are shot badly. And if you have the other style of uh, power supply here that doesn't use a coil here, just has a resistor, these capacitors become much more, well they become the filter. And they're usually much larger than this. And if they're weak, the radio will hum badly. So this is a very curious resistor here. Uh, curious in the sense that it's doing a, a job that's not easy to initially figure out what is happening. Um, so the important thing to note is where the ground point is made in the power supply. And a lot of radios, this chassis connection is made on this line coming out. This, this is the ultimate return, if you like, for the uh, DC, depending upon what kind of flow you've got in your head in terms of electron flow or, or, uh, or uh, I guess, hole flow. I hate to say that. Um, it's just interesting to know. Let's just look at where this wire, this is the only wire leaving here into the radio. Where is it going? Up to a very large resistor and onto the grid of the output tube. Very interesting. Okay, um, we'll talk a little more about that when we get to the output tube, just what's going on. Let's, uh, so out of the power supply is, is there anything taken from here? No. Looks like the whole thing is taken from the second side of the power supply. We're powering up the plate of the output tube, powering up all the rest of the plates these two through the IF coil and then this guy is getting his voltage same way. It's an awfully big resistor there. 220 M ohms. Now we got to be a little cautious here because in the old days M was used to denote a thousand because of the word mille in French. M-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, mille. Um, so a lot of these earlier radios, they use an M here. We would use a K today. I'm sure in France they use a K also. If it really is a meg ohm, you can see this one down here? They write the word meg, meg ohms, to not be uh, confused. Okay, that's surely that is the case. This is really a K here. <coughs> Any other oddballs? Well, if there are, we'll come across it. Go to the antenna. This is what's missing in this radio. This is missing. Um, hmm. So this this coil is like open-ended here. This is kind of uh, different, a little bit different uh, from from what. Well, I shouldn't put it that way. Th this whole a a arrangement could be on the antenna can be two loops on the antenna, one with many turns. This doesn't really exist unless you attach a wire to it. 
Well, I better up here stop talking here. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with this antenna. This is starting to suggest it's a wire antenna. This is a transformer mounted on the radio. Right now, from the radio, there's a wire hanging out the back. There's a ground wire and a longer wire, which is the antenna wire. We'll have to look at the radio and figure this out. The reason I think there might be a special uh, loop antenna for this radio is I see one in a photograph from from this radio, um, from from another person's um, uh, another person's radio, not not from this one. I've asked the owner of this radio. Did an antenna stay back? It's not very likely. He would be certainly knowledgeable enough to provide it. So chances are there is no antenna. Maybe there never was. I'm a little confused about that. For now, there isn't any kind of any kind of. Uh, loop antenna. Okay, enough of that. It's an important thing, but well, here we have uh, a tuning capacitor tuning against this coil, or, or maybe I should say this transformer. That's the compensator there. And they come straight off the antenna, straight into the mixer tube. So this tube, we have grid here which is being energized from the local oscillator. This is the oscillator down here, the tuning oscillator. You can see the variable uh, tuning capacitor here and its trimmer oh, compensator. And the signal is fed up to the grid through this capacitor. So you have the electron flow uh, modulated going through here by the oscillator frequency. You have the antenna signal coming in, the electron stream uh, kind of mixes them, and you end up with products. You end up with the two original frequencies, the antenna and the local oscillator, plus the sum of them and the uh, difference between them. So on, on this line, uh, just leaving aside what's happening here for a moment, you potentially have all those signals. You have all the antenna signals here, but shifted by the local oscillator frequency. And I've shifted high and shifted low. We're after a particular frequency out of that. This is kind of really where the tuning happens with the radio. It's fixed. Fixed at 460 kilohertz. And what you're doing by varying this is you're basically sliding the range of uh, AM signals, the 540 to 1700 or whatever it is, uh, you're, you're kind of sliding it in a sense, if you can kind of mentally picture that, uh, back and forth or up and down I guess in frequency and whatever signal out here has been converted to 460 will find itself ringing loudly in this coil. That loud ringing energizes this coil and we're on our way into the radio at 460 kilohertz. This is the little trimmer capacitors or compensators, what they're calling them. I'll be adjusting eventually and right onto the grid. I have a, a, a screen here. The screen is uh, AC grounded or signal grounded through this you know, fairly large capacitor signal capacitor. Okay, and the, uh, how have they handled this? This is the uh, suppressor grid uh, intended to keep the electrons that bounce off this from, from leaving the zone, basically. Getting back into the rest of the tube. They're kind of forced to find their way back to the plate even after uh, bouncing. <clears throat> it's a weird thought, isn't it? Bouncing. Bouncing. Bouncing electrons. Okay. Um, let me just do that again. So, um, you know, I don't know 100% of everything. Um, 
that's true of all of us, isn't it? What I don't understand here is that they've done something a little different. They, they, often the um, suppressor grid is just tied to the cathode, which is tied to ground. This is, you know, this is tied to the chassis here, or what I'm calling or ground, a very unfortunate term here in North America. But they haven't done that. They've tied it, oddly enough, to the grids, to the grids. What about this one? This one's the same. These are the two grids here. They're tied the same. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, no, no. Hmm. So part of making the oscillator oscillate is that there has to be some amplification of the oscillating signal in here or it will just damp itself out. It won't even appear, in fact. They must be using this grid as if it's a little plate. That's what I think they're doing. So they have a little amplifier happening right in here to, to, to make the oscillator oscillate. Okay. Don't need to understand this fully. It's just interesting and, and helpful in case there's some little trick you need to know about something to become aware of. So for some reason they didn't draw this in a can. Is that oversight? Let's look at the other one. I don't know. That's unusual because they had taken the time to draw this one in a can. Um, once in a while these uh, IF cans are not uh, grounded solidly to the chassis, but in fact are isolated from the chassis and then grounded to some other, and again, unfortunate term grounding, tied to some other element in the circuit. Uh, is that what they're trying to suggest here? I don't see that it's anything. There's no connection to it at all according to this. Let's look at the radio and try to understand why, 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 the di why this difference. could have an impact on alignment if something's not right, but I doubt anything is not right here. Go back here. So we have 460 hertz and, uh, coming into here, um, you know, with the, with the sidebands and the uh, radio station program. Out it goes. This is the main amplifier in the radio. This one's not doing so much amplifying. This one is. This is this is, so a very very weak tube here would make for a weak radio. Out we come into the next uh, IF transformer. Uh, yeah, see there's only one tuning thing here. One one compensator here. No compensator over here. How's that? Interesting. Okay, and they've put the filter, um, this will be a, an RF filter, they're trying to get rid of the RF at this point by dropping it into the uh, chassis through here. It's inside this can, which is a little bit unusual. They didn't even put a number on any of these parts. Well, they put a number on this one, well I guess you have to access this why they've numbered it, I guess. Okay, down we come. Here's where you can put in your uh, phono uh, cartridge signal. You could put your Bluetooth signal into here just the same way. I'd be a little cautious about doing that, but not terribly cautious in this radio because it has this big transformer. Now, it's just tied in here. There's no switch. Sometimes these are arranged so when you push the uh, plug in, it actually operates a little switch here. Kind of like how you plug in headphones and your speakers get turned off, same kind of thing, but not this radio. So if you want to listen to your records and not hear the radio, you're going to have to uh, tune the radio off channel. The, the last radio I was working on, they actually bent 
sharply one of the plates in the tuning capacitor so when you hit the end of the road with the tuning capacitor, I think when it was fully closed, it would short itself out and that would shut down the sound from the radio so you could hear your records with the, the radio on top, not this one. So when we, we get here we have a couple things. We have the uh, signal now after being rectified. Let's go back. I didn't really talk about the rectifier. So the output of this is running through a rectifier so you're getting a rectified current in here. We just tied the two plates together in this tube. Nothing, nothing special about that. So at this point you've got the rectified RF that was the RF maybe removed for a large to a large degree it kind of smoothed out if you like so we have the audio sitting here now that's been recovered by this uh, this trick the trick of rectifying it is a, it's a trick lots of tricks in these radios whole radio is a big trick uh, the output is fed to the top of the volume control the bottom is on the chassis So, you, so, so this is shown tied to the bottom of the bond. No, no, no. It's just on the just on ground. They, they, they could have could have separated this, put it here, and put their own ground thing on it. This is just a grid leak resistor for the grid up here. Let's follow this wire back. So, on this wire will be DC and the signal. There's no capacitor in here. Hmm. Um, a large resistor here is because the impedance of this side is very high and they want to keep it high. Why is it high? It's connected to nothing. If you trace these wires, they all go to open, open wires. They don't go anywhere. There's no current flow through here. No current flow. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can put a huge resistor here and, and really not drop the voltage across it because there's no current flowing through it. What, 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 what I was going to say, maybe this is where the audio is, is lost on this. I, I'm not sure what they're doing here. Oh, oh, okay. So they've shown this capacitor out here. This capacitor can typically be shown down in this area. I guess maybe he couldn't fit the ground symbol in on this dr drafting drawing here, so he's gone and stuck him way up here. So this capacitor could be considered the AVC capacitor. <coughs> Excuse me. It's damping the voltage changes that are occurring here. Maybe it's uh, killing any, uh, certainly any RF that's made it this far. And maybe even doing something with the audio here. That's, that's managed to get through here. I mean, absolutely, you don't want audio getting on these grids. That's for sure. That must be the case then. Okay. Um, so this, this voltage that's here is related to the rectification of the signal that's here. The stronger the signal coming through the radio, the more the rectification. The higher the voltage. <coughs> Excuse me again. Oh, did I, did I miss? No. No, no, no. Okay, and uh, that DC voltage uh, will vary as you tune across different signals. So, if you tune into a loud station, a lot of voltage is going to develop here, and DC is going to show up over here and be applied to the grids. <coughs> Excuse me. The varying grid bias potential, which is what it amounts to, uh, changes the amount of amplification occurring in these tubes. These tubes are designed to do this. It's an intentional thing. <clears throat> so a strong signal here weakens the amplification of these tubes. It weakens the signal here. It's like a governor, if you like. A weak signal won't produce nearly as much. A DC here um, maybe none. 
and these tubes will amplify a maximum amount. And this is why in these AM radios, when you tune off a station, the hiss shows up. And when you reach the next station, the uh, atmospheric noise on the antenna, the hiss, goes down. It's not because, as I always thought years and years and years ago, that the station was replacing the hiss. That's not what's happening. What's happening is the radio is turned up full blast when there's no strong signal. And so that's why you hear the hiss. And as you begin picking up a radio station signal, the amplification is knocked down on these tubes and the hiss goes down all the way to the point where you don't hear it. Or almost don't hear it. <clears throat> so it kind of gives a misleading feeling as you tune one of these radios. Um, if you did away with the AVC, you'd find out that the radio is not full of noise between stations. It's actually very quiet between stations. Kind of what you would imagine to be the case in reality. So that's a trick. It's a trick being played on you. All, almost all radios have this automatic feature in them. Otherwise you'd have a hard time having a big enough uh, range in the radio to handle a weak signal and a strong signal. Present a lot of problems. Okay, now we'll continue on. What's coming? Here we go, down to the volume control. So the audio is impressed across this resistor. These are usually pretty large. 10, let's just take a look on the, on the list here, 10. Volume control, they're not telling us. They're keeping it secret. Now this could be half a million ohms here. Um, this dotted line indicates the on-off switch is tied to the volume control, like a lot of radios. At this point, you introduce a capacitor to stop the DC that might be in here from going any further. If this is leaky enough, and it has to be, you know, you're going to leak through a 10 mega ohm resistor, so it can't be much of a leak. A little bit of DC through here makes the volume control noisy and you can't clean it away. <coughs> Excuse me. No matter how much you clean it, it still stays noisy. DC flowing in the, in the volume control. Now, it shouldn't be there because of this. What are they doing with this? Out comes the audio right up into this. This is really two tubes in one. And they use the grid to amplify the signal. It goes out here. You don't really use the grid to amplify the signal. The tube is used to amplify the signal. And this is another, this is a picofarad. Very small capacitor, uh, high impedance circuit in here. Don't need much of a capacitor to leak out any RF that still made it through. So there's a number of attempts to remove RF in here. This would be the DC supply coming through. The audio now is heading through this capacitor onto this grid. This is a two grid tube. So, this is using the screen here. <coughs> Excuse me. And another attempt to get rid of any RF that's still around into the output transformer, into the um, voice coil, voice coil, book, uh, bucking coil. I believe the intention of the bucking coil, and uh, I'm probably wrong in this, is to counter any hum that's coming out of the uh, field coil. Where's the field coil? It's showing down here. You could easily be wrong about that. But the idea is it's bucking any influence from the hum that this might be generating. This coil is sitting right up here. 
So we see no ground connections on the uh, secondary side of this. They don't show any. Good. Now what's the trick here? So the trick here is instead of putting the chassis ground down here, they put it on the other side of this resistor. And that means this is the really the, let me call it the lowest voltage, that's probably not the best way to put it. And this is raised up a little bit. So this is just a little bit positive. The most negative place being down here. So the whole chassis is just a little bit positive to this. But this is only exposed in the radio along this wire where it goes to this grid. This capacitor is blocking any DC that might be, that will be there. So in effect what they've done is they rather than excuse me <coughs> make a grid more negative in a sense relative to this point in the radio they've made all these cathodes a little bit positive. What's going on with my voice today? <coughs> Okay, um, so that's a bit of a trick. See, it's a relatively small resistor. It's a relatively small voltage that develops here, or and 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 develops here. I shouldn't have followed this line when I said that. It develops here. Very good. A fairly straightforward radio. Don't know what they're doing over here exactly. Some of what they do, no doubt, was discovered through experimentation, and there's probably four or five sort of approaches to how to wire a front end of a radio like this. They pick the one they like for whatever reasons that the designers knew at the time. If you think about it, this is the late 1930s, I'm pretty sure. This had to be, oops, this had to be really well understood to build something like this. I want to think back to our fellow human beings back there as being uh, less intelligent than us. I think, if anything, it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's a tour through here. I think I covered everything, or just about everything. If we look at the instructions again for alignment, where are we connecting the signal generator? So here's the signal generator area. Output connections to receiver high side to the 6A8EG grid cap. Grid cap, okay. High side to the, let's just look, 6A8E, it's this tube, 6A8E, it's the very first tube. So, one of these two grids here is actually the cap of the tube, and I'm guessing it's this one. And that's what they want you to feed in the uh, 460. Uh, kilohertz. I mean, is that right? Right? That's got to be right. 460 kilohertz. And you do these actions. 28A, 4B, and 4A. What? Where did those numbers come from? I'll worry about that later. Whoops, did I look at the wrong one? No? Oh yeah, I did. Nine, I did look at the wrong radio, didn't I? <laughs> 9A, 7B, 7A. 9A, 7B, 7A. 7A, 7B. 2, 2B. 9. There's the 9. So it's just basically these three IF adjustments. 2A and 2B, when did they come into it? Oop. The next step, 2A and 2B. Okay, I think that's more than enough extracted from the uh, schematic at this point. 2A and 2B are the screws on the capacitors. Very good. So uh, this morning, uh, one of my heroes, Bill Shatner, good Canadian by the way, 
is going to fly on a rocket up towards space. I don't really want to say he's going to be in space. Well, he's going to fly on a rocket. That's pretty impressive. Just taking a rocket flight up uh, 100 kilometers is pretty impressive in itself. So I don't want to miss that. So I think that's happening at 10 o'clock. I see it's 9 o'clock now. I think I'm just going to check up on how that's going before I get my head into uh, into this. And, and what is what is next? Next is next is a bunch of component replacements. So I don't have to get my head into too much to do that. Let's just take a little look here. One, two, three, four, five. These should go. Five. High wattage resistor here. It looks like it's been a little roughed up. A little overheated is what I mean by that. And then we got this guy to consider. It says on it Philco. Well, there's a good chance this is original. It's got a strap on it that is, how is it attached to the radio? Let me see here. I think it's been soldered. That would help us know if it's original or not. Let's blast it with a little extra light. No, I think there's a screw in there. It's a rivet. Okay, so it's riveted. So the fact that the rivet is intact means this is the original capacitor. Probably should be changed out. Uh, the only reason you want to leave it is because for some reason you like the idea that it's original. Seems to have all of its original tubes. But these parts are hidden from view. So original or not, they can't really be seen. I mean, the whole radio is hidden from view inside the cabinet. But people can peek in the back and see the nice tubes all shined up. Get rid of the cobwebs there. And how long would this last? I'm going to return this radio to the owner. He may start operating it with some regularity. And that may, I don't know, that, that may kill these. I mean, the word on the street is you operate these, they will repair themselves. For the money, the money's not an issue. It's tiny money doing these things. So, uh, should change it out. Be a really shame, a real shame to do all the work, put it back in the cabinet, give it back to the owner, he turns it on, and mm, you can hear a hum. That uh, would be a shame. So, we'll change that too. So, that's one, two, three, four, five. This one counts for two. Six, seven. Great, I'm just going to go check on Mr. Shatner. Okay, Captain Kirk's back on the ground again. Fantastic. That was pretty exciting to watch. I was just praying everything would go okay because I'd hate to see something bad happen uh, during any of these uh, fantastic uh, risks that people take. So, way to go, Captain Kirk. Okay, in the meantime, I managed to sneak in here, replace five of the capacitors. I've left the uh, filter capacitor in for now. And there you see the dead soldiers here. Next thing we want to do is give those guys a test and just see how bad off these really were. So I'm going to flip over to my capacitor checker here. Switch it on. And we're going to start with the uh, 0.01 capacitor that was responsible for carrying audio away from the volume control. We'll just see how this one is. Now the kind of test I'm doing here is very suitable for old radio capacitors. I'll just drop it there. I'm going to put voltage on the uh, capacitor. Uh, with this control I can select how much voltage. Then we will look in the magic eye, which is always very hard to show on camera, but hopefully you can see the pie opening in the magic eye here. And we will see what happens. Well, I should explain just a little more. So when I hit the switch, the switch is here. It's a spring-loaded switch. Rotate it. Voltage goes on the capacitor. The eye will probably close briefly as the capacitor charges. Then the eye should open right up to where it is now if it's a good capacitor. If there's any leak of current through the capacitor, the eye will, will stay closed to some degree. 
my expectation the eye will not open that's my expectation so here we go we're going to do the test okay so the eye is opened about halfway which means this is like a halfway good capacitor well this is not a quantitative test of course it's qualitative so that explains probably why the radio was able to work the leak in this capacitor would leak voltage uh, towards the grid of the uh, first audio amp, but a very, very small leak. Uh, maybe not even enough to upset the grid potential there or the bias, but maybe. Okay, now this is one of two capacitors. Uh, these ones doing heavier duty. That first capacitor doesn't see much voltage during its life. But this guy does. And by the way, if you're reading this, I guess you can't really read it. It says 25 volts, but the actual voltage is 50 volts. If you notice, I didn't go any higher because 50 volts, <coughs> excuse me, 50 volts wasn't enough to judge the condition. Here we go, capacitor number two. The eye is not opening at all on 50 volts. So this one's it got a more serious leak in it, but probably in a less sensitive position in the uh, radio. So the leak may not have been, also may not have been significant in the operation of that the radio. This one also was sustaining a pretty heavy voltage during its life when the radio was on. Let's see what it does. Same as the last guy, it's not opening at all. So these are bad capacitors. Now the next two, interesting, these are molded ones and I could tell when I was working on the radio these are actually on. These are actually replacement capacitors for the original paper ones. So these are being replaced for the second time, basically. Clip them on here. Okay, let's see how these ones stood up to the, the riggers. Not open. These ones are also doing a harder, heavier duty, and that they had uh, a more significant voltage across them, which I would imagine wears them out quicker. Uh, can't imagine that it wouldn't. They also could be, you know, it could be other factors. They're in a warmer area in the radio, not that they're getting generating heat themselves, but that they're being uh, sub subjected to adjacent sources of heat. Here we go. Oh, now that's interesting. That one, that one's actually the best of the lot. And you can see the difference really isn't very much. And now, just to keep everything on the up and up, I'm going to grab a new capacitor. And this is a new capacitor. It's in the style of the old ones, but it's a brand new manufactured capacitor. Let me just see if I'm shooting bull here or not. Okay, here we go. Now, all those tests were done at the lowest setting, 50 volts. Here we go. You see the eye just popped right open. 150 volts, right open. 250 volts, right open. 350 volts, right open. And the last one, 450, right open. And that's what a good capacitor does happy to do that once in a while just to double check everything now I just put around 400 volts on this capacitor very briefly but it could retain that voltage this uh, machine when you let go of this control puts a short on it uh, you know the general rule is the length of time you spend charging the capacitor is equal or should be equal to the length of time you spend discharging it uh, especially electrolytic capacitors if you think the momentary boom discharge drains it not really. That voltage can come back and get you. Not those little ones, though. I don't think a little one's going to retain a significant charge that would, you know, make it a dangerous thing to have around. But, but, okay. Let me clear off the uh, leads here so we don't somehow get them mixed up in the radio. And we're going to test this guy. Find out if I ruined it. Once again, I was very careful to not make a mistake. That pretty much means nothing. So 
strikes me sometimes the more careful I am, the more likely I am to boob it up. Okay, let's put it like this. I have a nice view of it. Let's get this out of here. Okay. Switches off. Power cord's ready. Antenna amounts to nothing. Let's just put something on it. I got a long piece of wire handy here I can just put on it here. Well, we'll hook up my outdoor antenna, but in fact, I'm aware that this antenna is not switched on at the moment, but it's a nice long piece of wire anyway. We'll, we'll, we'll put it on after we turn it on so we can see the effect. This out of here. I so like to clean up my bench a little bit before I turn things on. that. Here we go. Okay, so the switch is off on the radio right now. Let's use the switch for the first time. Okay, you missed the dim bulb going back here. For sure, you would want to turn this on with some kind of protection. I'm using the dim bulb system to do it. Okay, we're up around uh, 90 volts now. I'm going to screw in the other light here. It drops the resistance of the dim bulb system. Now we're up to 100 volts. That's probably enough. It takes a little while. When you drop the supply voltage, it takes quite a bit longer for the tubes to warm up. Let's see what we got. I can hear a little hum. Doesn't that sound lovely? Okay, with no antenna. Piece of wire. Powerful noise signals. If we pick a station up, I'll be blown away. We need a bit more antenna. Okay, so let's put the lead on. I may have to run down and I will have to run down and turn the actual antenna on. Turn this down here. We're in for a surprise. Not bothering with the ground side of this. Well, that proves the radio's working. I do have an interesting antenna here. Maybe we can give it a try. And that's this uh, this commercial loop antenna, which uh, yeah, I can definitely hear a hum coming out of here, but it doesn't quite sound like a power supply hum. Of course, with the speaker out in the open like this, the bass response is, is greatly reduced because of the air leak around the edge of it. So it could be humming. Certainly don't feel it. Not to worry about that. Um, I'm going to try to hook up this antenna here, and we'll just give it a go. Okay. So what I've done is uh, this antenna comes with a, a jack at the back. Just plug a regular guy into it. You don't actually have to use this jack, but we do in the case of this in this radio. It has no antenna in, on its own. The other end of the cord is here. I just clip leaded it, one on the antenna, one on the ground. Now, I'm not trying to promote this, this particular antenna, um, but uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not doing any promotional thing. It's a matter of policy here. I've decided I'm not going to get involved in that kind of stuff. So if you see something like this, you can assume, yes, I went and bought this on my own. Is it, this is not a sales job of any sort, although, guess what? This antenna is a lot of fun. 
are they? Less than 50 bucks, I think. Texan AN100. I think there's an AN200. Looks like they just reduced the amount of plastic a little bit to save a few pennies. This is a tuned antenna. It, it has a, a large loop. You can see it here of all this copper going around. That has a capacitor against it, which you can tune with this knob. And then there's a pickup coil somewhere in here. And the pickup coil is what's hooked up to the radio. Okay, so let's I'm just kind of at a random spot here in the middle of the band. We're just going to tune this and see if it doesn't come up to life as we... Look at that. Huh? Okay, turn it down. Very, very sharp. This is also a very directional antenna. There's nothing there. So let's... There's a French station somewhere in this area. Let's see if we can find it. The problem is I have to tune this as I tune this. So. Very sharp tuning on it. chance the antenna is aimed exactly as it shouldn't be. I could be missing the station simply because of the direction of the antenna. French station may have been just a little further this way, or it may be beyond reach, or the antenna may be aimed wrong. Let's just get somebody in here. Stronger stations are down in this area. We'll turn this 90 degrees. I've got it here on my bench, which isn't the best spot either, of course. So another thing may have happened, although it doesn't sound like it to me, but uh, the impedance matching between the radio and the antenna may be terrible. The radio is looking for an antenna with an impedance, impedance, I don't know, a couple hundred ohms, and maybe this is just 10 ohms, I don't know. Something's coming through though. Why don't we revert to the wire, find the station. Let's do that. Revert to the straight wire. The other thing too is that because this is a uh, balanced antenna, it's a, a loop, it wants to work like this. So that's why you have to have two wires hooked up to the radio. To get that happening, my outdoor antenna, which we are not actually using, just basically using a wire that, a cable that runs through my house. That's basically what this is. And I don't bother hooking up the ground on it. It's just, it's just doing this. Station there. Okay, we'll use this one. I'm going to guess that's the sports station. Okay, it might get something even like that. But we really need the other wire hooked up too. See how the radio went quiet? The very low impedance of this antenna. Which is good for noiseless operation. Tune this in. Okay, aim it. Bring it out here. Let's bring it out. We've got a pretty long cable here. I can bring it out a distance. Like, they've moved on, their, their players are really good. Oh, you're, you're 
Springer will always be known as that. It's like George Springer. George Springer will be always known no. as part of that. No. Yes, he will be. No. Always. You cannot be part of that. This is that you I'm gonna put this. are not capable of wants to be here in the middle of space. Of forgiving and forgetting with the Houston Astros. Come on, Mr. Who cares about forgiving? Well, what do I, what do I got to Yeah, I don't care. Didn't, didn't change my life that they cheated. I okay. <laughs> Yeah, they'll always be known as that. Oh. <laughs> okay, first I kicked the antenna. And then the leads fell off. Maybe, maybe we've almost done enough already, but I would like to try and get that French station. Why so quiet? Stay here. Make it stay. Okay. Why so quiet? <laughs> Actually, kick the tuning knob. Really very good reception with that antenna. Not when they get paid what he's asking to get paid. Absolutely not. Give us a couple of more, Mr. Bobo. So Daryl and Sudbury said, Okay, we're going to head for the French station up here somewhere. After they beat the Leafs last year. I've got to retune the antenna. just suddenly disappeared. What's going on? So, the, there's various noise signals across here and I happen to stop where there's no noise and then I tune the antenna and go, oh, there's no noise. But it's really just because there's no noise to tune in. Another spot, there's a pile of noise. Don't you need to tune the antenna? Yeah, you're just being fooled by these very powerful noise signals here. Picking up something, wow, that's pretty good. Let's do this. Okay, can't have music or I get a copyright hit. Um, don't know, that's, that's, I don't usually get an English station anywhere except down in this part of the band. Could, could be, I don't know. The reason for trying to pick up this French station is not particularly enamored with French. It's because it's a very good test signal. When I'm going to do the alignment and stuff like that, I want to do this comparison again and see see what I got out of it. Well, I don't think we're going to find it easily. I'm going to spend all day doing this. We don't really need it. Very good. I think that's very good. Very, very good. All that's needed now is to I'm going to get rid of the hum, so that's the other power supply capacitor, and then um, uh, it's an alignment deal, and then we're done. You can't imagine the radio is poorly aligned. It's, it's working really well. Fantastic. So thanks a lot for watching this tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll do alignment, and, uh, 
and be dominant. Great. See ya.